My name is Burr Sutter. I work for a company called Red Hat. I'm going to tell you a little story today. Hopefully you enjoy my little bit of storytelling. And one thing I really appreciate about being here in Transylvania, this is my very first time, by the way, in Cluj, Napoca. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me back for another Vox Days. I really do love coming to Romania. But this is, I'm going to tell you a little story. You guys are ready for that? Because this is actually a place with a great story. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about supersonic, subatomic, super fast, super small, microservices written in Java. So I'm hoping that all you folks here like Java. But let's actually tell you a little story right up front. First of all, there's actually a great deal of history in this part of the world. In the hotel that we're in right now, or maybe even the coat of arms associated with Cluj-Napoca, you know, might actually suggest something. And I love the fact that we're here on Halloween, which is actually a celebration of many great things, if you think about it. And I am going to tell you a little story today. And I got to tell you, it's going to be terrifying and scary because I'm going to show you some code as well. We know code is terrifying. Okay? But I love the fact that the story of Dracula, which how many people here have read the story of Dracula at this point? Oh, not enough of you. It is a phenomenal book, and it's free, by the way. So Gutenberg Press, I'd encourage you to go download it, get the PDF, read it on your device. It's a phenomenal book. Written by an Irishman, though not by Romanian, so keep that in mind too. But it is actually a great book. I highly encourage you to read it. But let me tell you a little bit about it, okay? Because we're gonna talk about a lot of cool things here in the Java ecosystem as we get going here. So I love the fact that we're up here on the hill, we're at this nice hotel, we're here in Romania, okay? And the story of Dracula basically is about Count Dracula and of course him terrorizing people throughout England, or London in particular. And you know hopefully about that history. I'm not going to like really drill down on that. We'll just do some fun stuff with it. But we're going to really have some fun with it. So good morning. Did I get that right? Happy Halloween. OK. OK. Well, let's actually tell you about more of the story. Here's a great quote. This is actually part of the story that I want to make sure you understand. In darkness, there are some lights, right? In the darkness of life, there are lights. You are those lights. The fact that you're even here today, right now, for your own education, taking time off from work, taking time off from school, and here to get additional education, already means you're one of the elite individuals of the IT profession throughout the globe. There are approximately 10 million professional software developers on this planet, yet how many are here right now? 200, 250? And throughout the globe, there's probably 100,000 people that actually go out and get continuing education. They go out to their conferences, they go out to their local meetup, participate in their local Java user group or JavaScript user group. So keep that in mind. You're already the elite of the industry. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact you're going to spend some time with me today. Another great quote from Dracula, okay, at least the book, at least, okay? We learn more from failure than from success. So keep that one too in mind. Now let me take you back in time to 1993. I mentioned that I worked for Red Hat. And as I said when I worked for Red Hat, it was born back in 1993 and 1994 with this thing called Red Hat Linux. And Linux, of course, was a game changer for the industry. Think about what Linux has done. It's actually enabled this concept of open source to spread throughout all of our ecosystem. The concept of the cloud was only successful because of Linux and the free operating system that it provides to the world at large. So I want to make sure you understand that little bit of history because it's very important. But Red Hat does not only equal Linux. A lot of people think it does. But actually, Red Hat is more than Linux in many cases. We certainly love Linux. And we definitely love Linux, but we also love this thing called Kubernetes. We call it OpenShift, and we love Java. And we're going to talk about Java here today, OK? So that's our Java. Let's also go back in time and talk about 1999, another important year. I know for many of you, you weren't in the industry in 1999. You weren't programming back in 1999. In my case, I've been programming since 1985. So it's been a little while for me. So back in 1999, it was an important year for me. I was a software consultant. I taught Java. I did Java consulting. I made a lot of money in 1999 because people were worried about Y2K. People were worried about the dot-com, which ended up being the dot-bomb. But things were very different back then. As a matter of fact, this is an amazing movie. If you're familiar with the movie, The Matrix, it blew people's minds. That opening scene where Trinity jumps up in the air and they spin her 360 when she kicks the police officer, drove people insane. It was absolutely incredible. As a matter of fact, it really was the year of the ladies. The top songs in 1999 were Cher, who thought? She's only like 95 years old now, but she could still rock, okay? Or TLC, 
Unfortunately, they're no longer together when the members died, but it was an amazing, amazing year for female performers. And most people here in Europe tend to forget. You guys like football. You like soccer. You might have heard of this organization called FIFA. Well, the U.S. won the World Cup in 1999. Anybody remember that? Shame on you. We did win the World Cup in 1999. As a matter of fact, I was a coach. I actually coached soccer. I did for many years, 14 years. I coached soccer in the United States for little girls all the way from age four to 18. This was an incredibly important moment for a United States citizen, for a young lady inside the United States. She actually looked at this image, this image which was very famous, and understood that she could achieve great things. As a matter of fact, we just won the World Cup again in 2019. Okay? So keep that in mind. But the reason I take you back to 1999 is because of this point right here. In 1999, if you were a software developer who wanted to build Hello World with Java, you wanted to start your very first Java application, it cost you close to half a million dollars to get started. Half a million dollars. So that's why most of you didn't do Java in 1999. I did, but I had to have some really high-end clients to pay for that kind of money. Literally, it cost that much to get started, and then you had to hire someone like myself, who was an expensive consultant, to help you out with it. So it was actually hard to get started in Java. And today, it is actually zero dollars. As a matter of fact, you will pay very few dollars. You might only pay nine cents an hour to get started with Java. That is why all of you and all the people around the globe can now use Java for anything that they want to build. Open source has finally changed the game. What we used to pay a lot of money for, we now pay very little money for. Okay? We'll keep going here, because this is a story of microservices as well. And if you actually look at the history of microservices, and I don't have time to walk you through it all, but you can kind of see it started way over here in the world of Linux, and we actually looked at the world of virtualization, and of course we created the cloud. There was this thing called a Linux container. We also adopted Agile and DevOps along the way. But it got super interesting in 2013 and 2014 when things like Docker were born, Spring Boot were born, microservices were officially defined, Kubernetes was born. And Red Hat actually started contributing to Kubernetes back in 2014. As a matter of fact, 2014 and 2015 were in very important years. In 2015, you can go to YouTube and watch this video. It's a presentation that I put on for Red Hat for well over 1,000 plus people in the room. It was a keynote uh, at Red Hat Summit. And one of the things we wanted to demonstrate was the concept of the Linux container being incredibly performant, incredibly fast, incredibly lightweight. So we launched 1,026 containers live on stage for the whole audience that was there. In two and a half minutes, we launched 1,026 application servers and invited the audience to use their phone to put a little doodle on their phone and basically take that image and plant it on each one of those containers. And we did it. And here was the problem with that. It was an amazing demonstration. But I'm a Java champion, and I had to do this demonstration with Node.js. Java was too fat and slow. And I've been thinking about this problem ever since. OK? So hopefully that sets you up for what we're going to look at here. We have been come up with something new this year. In 2019, we invented this new thing called Quarkus. We call it the supersonic subatomic Java because it is Java faster and smaller than Node.js. And I'm going to show you that today. Is that awesome? It'll be fun? OK. So one thing to talk about is this Mark Twain quote. Anybody remember Mark Twain, famous American author? The reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. And like all scary stories, it involves a tragic death. Actually, no one actually died here. As a matter of fact, Java's doing incredibly well. Java's certainly not dead. We've been talking about it being dead in 2006. But look here, Java's still the number one on the Tayobi index. It is number one, two, or three up here with JavaScript and Java and C++. Even in Hacker Rank, which is where the cool kids hang out, it's number two to JavaScript. So Java is doing incredibly well without the ecosystem. So just keep that in mind, OK? Because there's so much goodness inside of Java still. There's so much amazing technology that's part of the language itself, the Java virtual machine, and all the frameworks that it consumes. That is why we love Java, is because the ecosystem is incredibly healthy. But it was also this ecosystem that made Java so slow. The frameworks that you add on top of Java made a huge assumption. They made an assumption that they could scan the file system, the class path, load all the jar files, stream all those jar files into memory, scan them all for their annotations, 
and build a meta model in memory. And that's why it took a while to start up and why it takes so long to build that meta model and it holds all that memory for the entire duration of your application. That's memory you cannot reclaim, memory that doesn't get garbage collected, and all that file scanning takes time. Yes, you can do it lazy. Be lazy about it. But as soon as some point in the code path, as soon as some call makes a call into one of those things, you do have to load it at that moment. So you have to keep that in mind, OK? Because with Java, all this framework loading caused us to put on weight. It was good. It was like candy. It was like ice cream. It was like cake. But we put on weight. And we noticed this when we put Java in a container. When we put Java in a container, we actually would use this thing called C groups, which is part of the Linux kernel. A Linux container is part of the Linux technology, and it uses C groups and namespaces where you can lock down specific attributes. Uh, you can basically control the memory and CPU associated with that thing. You lock it down, and when you do, it goes boom. And it is pretty frightening. People will see it go OOM killed on their app, uh, in their production runtime. OK, OOM killed. And that's when you know you run into this, because by default, Java tries to consume more than its constrained memory and CPU. But if you use a lot of containers, you really notice this issue. OK? So I want to make sure we get into this, because we're going to show you this thing called Quarkus, and I want to show you some live code as well. So Quarkus is the technology that addresses all of this. It is about 10 times smaller, about 100 times faster, depending on your use case. You can go look at our website and go you know, decide if you believe those statistics or not. But I want to show you some things live, and we'll see what we'll get today, OK? So it, holds, it supports this live reload feature. It also supports jars, fat jars, as well as native executables. We're going to see those. And we're also going to see imperative and reactive. So you saw the presentation earlier about reactive programming. Uh, and actually, the previous presenter mentioned Undertow, which is our, the, the world's fastest web server that we have at Red Hat. But we've actually reinvented it yet again. You're going to see that here now. We have one even faster at this moment. OK? So let's get into this. Let's actually show you how we build a little application. I think that'll be a lot more fun. I'm going to actually go to the Quarkus website here. You can kind of see it's Quarkus.io. That's where I am at. And I'm going to come to the Quarkus Getting Started Guide, OK? Getting Started Guide. And it's because I'm going to grab this one line from here. There's actually multiple ways to get started. This is my favorite one. But there is also a code.quarkus.io where you can kind of point and click what you want here, right? If I want JSON yeah, as an example. But we'll come back to that, because I want to show you this kind of simple command line getting started tool. I'm going to come over here, and let's actually make this a little bit bigger, just to kind of make it easy to see. OK. And we're going to say, run that Maven command. It's a Maven plugin. Uh, and it's going to basically download everything I need. So I can say com.burrsutter. And I can, let's call this thing Dracula. Why not? OK. Dracula is the name of the project. One little snapshot. Yes. And then yes. And then yes. All right. Let's see, did it create direct? OK, fantastic. I have my project now. Notice that the project includes PUMXML, a simple text file or a Java file, and a couple Docker files. We'll poke around those in a second. Let me bring up Visual Studio Code, which is my favorite editor here. And actually, Visual Studio Code has been acting up on me a little bit today. We'll see how it behaves. And I'm going to go look at this Java file. And I can come in here and start editing Java code, OK? Now, here's one thing I want to mention about Visual Studio Code. Uh, well, not that button, this button here. Let's go here. Dun, 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 dun. And right here, actually, it was Red Hat that provided the language support for Java for Visual Studio Code. This is also free and open source. And unlike the Semantic Cafe I showed you earlier that cost $50,000 for a team of 10, this costs $0. And it's free and open source. So again, open source has fundamentally impacted everything that we do. But let me go here into the Java code at this point. And you can see it says, return hello, OK? The first thing you'll want to do as a, as a person working with Quarkus is you want to bring up a terminal of some sort. And I'm going to say maven compile Quarkus dev, OK? I'm going to put this into development mode. And development mode means that it has a live reload capability. So I can see it says hello there. Let me just go back to my browser. I'm going to just come over here and say localhost 8080, hello. And it says hello there. We can make that bigger. OK, nice hello. So refresh, hello. So here's, here's where the magic happens. If I come here and say salute, OK, save, refresh. You guys see that? All right, well, let's make it say something else. I'm originally from Hawaii, so I'll make it say aloha, and I'll say refresh. 
edit, save, refresh. Now, some of you are going, well, that's kind of cool. But if you were a Node.js person, you would be like, that's the way it always works. Exactly. So we were tired of those Node.js people being faster and smaller and cooler than us. You get my point here? OK. But let's actually go build something for real, right? That's Hello World. Oh, no. oh, let me go ahead and fix my test. And actually, let's just put this back this way. OK, save. And we do have a test here. You want to fix your test. Uh, we'll keep this very straightforward. OK, make that. I can, let me double check that I run my test. And let's see if we get green checks. The test running is interactive and even works when we're in dev mode. Uh, you can kind of see there's my green checks. All right, fantastic. So let's actually go add something more for real, OK? Uh, one of those tools we have with the Maven extension, with the Maven plugin, is this Quarkus colon list extensions. Let's see here. If I can type correctly, it's hard typing in front of a lot of people. OK, here we go. List extensions. So I'm going to come in here and say Maven, and we're going to add a bunch of extensions to make a real application. Because while I love all, like all the fancy stuff, at the end of the day, what we do is we actually write data to a database, and we get data from a database and send it to an API or user interface. That's primarily what we do as software developers. So I'm going to come in here and look at all these amazing things. I can make Amazon Lambdas. I can do Spring programming. There's Undertow if we want Undertow. But I also want, let's see, oh, I'm going to just use REST Easy and JSONB. And then I'm also going to come in here and pick something else. Let's see. Oh, I want this to be a Postgres database. We have both reactive and non-reactive database connections. And then um, well, we'll just take a traditional Postgres. And also, we need some object relational mapping. Uh, let me go and get Hibernate Panache. I want to show you Panache. So Hibernate is actually the place we first figured out how to do all of this, by the way. So in other words, what you're about to see, we learned with the Hibernate project, which is one of the most complex, large frameworks in open source and it's part of the Red Hat team as well. OK, so let me hit return there. OK, we updated things. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. The build file, yes. Let's go ahead and make sure the build file was updated. So we see that things live reloaded there. And I now have things like Postgres. And I have ORM. And I have uh, things like REST Easy. OK, so now we're ready to build our application. Remember, edit, save, refresh, to do, dot Java. I'm going to build a new entity. So let's go build a class here. And I'm going to call this thing an entity. It didn't. It helps you spell entity correctly. There we go. And I'm going to say it has a public string title. This is going to be a to-do application. Public Boolean completed. Dun, 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 dun. OK, I told you to be some terrifying live coding. OK, int and order. In the case of order, that actually has a special meaning in our database. So we're going to actually say, let's change the column name and call it ordering. All right, OK, good. And ooh, we got we to get, um, get the right import statement there. There we go, fantastic. And now normally what you do when you build an entity for Java persistence architecture, JPA, or Hibernate, you have getters and setters and custom finders and all that. I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to say extends pan uh, panache entity. And I get all that for free. OK, so I don't have to type anything else. So that is my entity. And then, OK, remember, edit, save, refresh. Let's go check that out. Uh, oh, we got an error. You're not supposed to do this in front of a big audience. Oh, hold on. Um, here we go. Let's see. Hibernate. Oh, no JDBC driver. I remember what I forgot to do. I didn't specify a data source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's specify a data source. The way you do that is you go to application of properties, and you say Quarkus. And dot, and then you start putting this in. Now, I'm not going to bother you with that. I could type all that in, but let's go ahead and just make this a little bit faster. I, I do keep this in a little copy and pasteable buffer here. But let's just do this as Dracula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have DB Dracula in our Postgres database. All right, and this, we'll just use the same user ID and password. Hit save. And then um, that reminds me, I do need to go to my database over here, PG admin. Let's see here. OK, that looks good. Create. OK, and let's put this in. And dun, dun, privileges, we got to create the user ID and password. And then we got to create the empty database over here in my Postgres database. Fantastic. OK, save. And then refresh. All right, we're good again. As a matter of fact, we're really good again. Let's go look at that database. OK, let's go look at that database. If things have come off well, come on, tables to do, and columns. We have a database schema defined. 
you can define your schema on the fly, edit, save, refresh, okay? So that's actually part of Hibernate, has been for quite some time, but you can see where it says database generation, drop and create, okay? So that's what we were taking advantage of there. So we have our to-do object. Let's go add some business logic to this thing. Let's come over here now and say new to-do resource.java, okay? Another class, and I'm gonna say I want at path, because this is gonna be a RESTful endpoint. It's gonna to respond to slash API. Let me make sure we get that import in there. It's gonna produce, produces, there we go, media type. It's gonna, uh, application JSON, right? Everyone wants JSON. Yep, we'll get that. And then consumes, I know not everybody wants JSON, but it's kind of fun that way. Okay, and then we're, the front end will want JSON. So let's get some JSON in there. Let's make sure we have consumes imported. Fantastic, that looks good. At get, and then public. And we're gonna return a list, yeah, list of to-dos. Okay, a list of to-dos, get all. And, oh, let's, um, let's get the list imported. We want this one right there, there we go. And then we're gonna say return to do list all. So that finder method is built right in there. And good, okay, great, save. And so notice that slash API, edit, save, refresh. Let's see how we're doing over here. Let's go to API, okay. And it's an empty array. There's nothing in our database yet. Let's start adding some things, okay. Let's actually have a little fun with this. Before we run out of time, post. That's how we add something, we post. We want the post to be transactional because it needs to write to the database in a proper transaction. And uh, oh, got to get that imported correctly. Let's see there, come on, oh, come on, we'll get it there in a second. And then we'll public, uh, yeah, response, add one. We're gonna add a to-do item. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Okay, and then, oh, come on, pick, come on, don't lose my imports there, get them straight, there we go. Okay, so now we're gonna say item.persist. And then we're gonna say return, response, status, okay, and then status dot created, there we go, and then we're gonna return the entity, yeah, we'll return the entity of item, and build, okay? And I think I did that right, fantastic, okay. If I did that correctly, now I just need to do a post. I could do a curl command or use swagger or something like that, you can use swagger UI, but I actually have a user interface that's already pre-built, it actually comes from the folks at Todo MVC, so let me just, I just have it here on my local machine, I'm gonna grab it. This is just a free open source user interface for to-do items that actually has been implemented in a number of different technologies. So where's Dracula at over here? This is the one, okay, resources. Let's get it over here, so paste, okay. And as I mentioned, this is to-do, to-do mvc.com. If you want React, View, Angular, Backbone, all the different options, I have the View option in this case. Okay, but let's go refresh, and let's go to the right URL. So by default, there is an index HTML out of the box, but I don't want that one, I want to do, to do. So one, two, three, go back to our database. Let's go see what it looks like here, uh, refresh. Okay, and then we're gonna come over here and look at all the rows, and we have one, two, three, all right. We're now reading and writing. You guys remember CRUD, create, read, update, and delete? We're doing create and read at this point. But let's do a little bit more. We gotta add a little bit more business logic to this. Let's go ahead and add the delete, okay, and add transactional as well. We want it to be transactional. And then we want also to change the path slightly because if you're gonna do a delete, the ID is gonna come in. I'm gonna say public, whoa, public response, uh, helps if you spell response, uh, delete one, and we're gonna delete based on the path parameter that comes in, and that is gonna be the ID, yes, ID, long ID, and that's all we really need for input, and we're gonna say uh, to do, to do entity dot, uh, sorry, equal, helps if you spell entity correctly, doesn't really matter actually, it's just a variable name, uh, but to do, find by ID, there we go. We're gonna find the one that was passed in. Let me get my import straightened out here. We want that one, okay. And, and then we're gonna say entity.delete. We're gonna delete the one. And we're gonna return a response and no content, just simple. Nothing to return in the case of a delete. If I did that correctly, all right, everything's green. So let me see, we did our edit, save, refresh. 
Well, let's close this one so we come back over here correctly. Refresh. And notice it goes back to nothing. Two, three, because it's create an update, right? It drop an update. Um, but let's delete number two here. And then actually, let's just go and delete number one, leave it at number three. Let's go see if our delete works. And let's do refresh. Go refresh over here. Check out our data. And we can kind of see it's just three. OK, so our delete works. Fantastic. We're doing well here. We're doing well. OK, we've got a little bit more to show you, though. Uh, I'm going to do the patch. And actually, the patch is very close to the same. So I'm going to just copy and paste this part right here. And let's get a closing curly brace. And we're going to say update one. OK, that's what a patch does. Patch, patch. And let's see, yep, yep. And But with the patch, there's going to be a to-do item passed in. OK, so we're then going to have to map the one we found in the database. Oh, it helps if we spell patch correctly. There we go. All right. And we're going to basically say entity dot dot. All right, completed equal to item dot completed. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Entity dot. And we're going to say ID, find item dot ID. We're just mapping it in, right? All the things the user passed in will be mapped into the database in this case. And the uh, title, the part that matters a lot, is this title, OK, because that's what the user types in. And we're going to map that in. And if we did that correctly, we're going to return response, OK? And then we're going to return, let's just return the entity in this case, build, OK? I think I did that about right. Let's see. We'll find out, OK? Let's go over here, edit, save, refresh. OK, so one, two, three again. But let's actually change them up now. Uh, so we love Java. OK? We, 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 you know, we can learn Quarkus. And we can be awesome and scary. How about that? OK. So we're going to come over here now, and let's go check this out. I'm curious to see if I did it right as well, because when you're doing this on the fly in front of so many people, you don't know when you might get it all wrong. Uh, OK. Oh, oh it, no. Did it refresh correctly? Let's see. Maybe not. Maybe I didn't do it right. Let me double check. And, 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 well, we can actually check here, too. Let's see. OK, oh, I did not update correctly. I did do something wrong. Let's see if we can figure out what I did wrong. Uh, dun, 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 dun. It is transactional. We did the patch. We did the update. It updated, and, and I did the save. It looks like it's all saving correctly for me. But we did something with our update. Didn't work out. Why did our update not work out? Let's, find, let's see if we have a few moments. We'll figure it out. Uh, uh, stuff, OK. Let's see, why did that not work out? Refresh, and view, and all rows. OK, my update is not working. I'll have to go figure out exactly why my update's not working. I think I did the proper refresh over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, well, we'll come back to that at some point, because I actually have one that's already completed. Hmm, I'll have to think about that. Transactional, something of that nature. They should be fine. We'll find out exactly what I went wrong, where I went wrong there. But let's not worry about that for now, because here's what I really want to show you. You can build this little application. You can do the Maven package, OK? Maven package. And that is going to give you the fat jar, right? That's going to give you the big jar file. It's going to run my test. It's doing the full Maven thing here. You can kind of see there it goes. And actually, let me stop the one that's running over here. OK? And let's go target. And you can kind of see there's the jar file. LS, uh, let's look at the jar file. Notice that jar file is 1.3 megabytes in size. That's because it's actually a thin jar, not a fat jar. It you have to include the lib folder as well, which are where the dependencies are. We do this optimization for Linux containers. You op this is an optimization for Linux containers, which you can hold those in different layers. But let's try this, java-jar, OK, target. And let's see, Dracula and runner. And let's see if we can run it real fast. OK, there we go. OK, so it runs. And this is our little application. OK, and refresh again. There we go. OK, still looks like it's working. But I want to show you one more thing. Maven package p native. All right, so this, there's some special magic about to happen here now. The reason it is so fast is because we actually take all that file scanning, annotation scanning, meta model creation that are part of all the frameworks, part of all that startup time, and we move it to compile time. It's no longer startup time, it's now compile time, ahead of time compilation, ahead of time build. So what's happening at this very moment is using a technology called Grail VM. Okay? So if we go, I have Grail VM running right here. 
And Grail VM has this very special feature called native image. But what we've done is we've optimized the frameworks to be ready for Grail VM native compilation. And all the stuff that you don't need is removed. It's a closed world assumption. It assumes it understands all the call paths throughout your application, and it'll get it compiled to just the bare minimum that you need. Think of the Java runtime. By default, Java SE or Java runtime includes tons of things you never use, including like a web server that's built into it, or maybe XML parsers you don't need. But if you don't use those, you don't have to use those. Think about Hibernate for a section, for, for just a moment. Hibernate includes all the classes you need to connect to an Oracle database and do Oracle object relational mapping. What if you're connecting to Postgres like I am here? I don't need to carry the Oracle classes around with me. I can remove those. So all the dead code elimination is occurring here, and this is going to be optimized for a native executable environment. And we don't have to wait around. It's almost done. It does take a little while to run uh, and uses a fair bit of memory and a fair bit of CPU to do this analysis because it is going through the whole thing. Oh, it actually completed. Let's check it out. Uh, let's see. OK. All right, here it is right here, 57 megabytes. 57 megabytes, and let's try to run it real quick. So this is the one I just created. Run it, and notice it started in 0 0.038 seconds. Insanely small, insanely fast. So where does that matter? OK, so I already have one of these things built, uh, and I have actually have it running here, not there. Over here. All right, let's see if we can make this work. Uh, oh, I got an error in my connectivity. So I'm connecting to a public cloud environment. I'm actually using this thing called Kubernetes, otherwise known as OpenShift. And it's actually running two versions of my Node.js application up there. Or sorry, my, my, not my Node.js application. My Java application is incredibly fast. So let me pull it. And let me make sure I go look at it. Yeah, let's look at this one over here. So this, this is what it is. Let me refresh. OK, let's put in one. OK, you can see there's the one that goes into the database. And there's two different pods here. Why is this thing not working? Come on. Yeah, dun, 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 dun. Sometimes with some network connectivity issues can make this a little bit tricky, like it's not wanting to pull over here. But you can see there's two different pods, OK? Two different pods right now. So I have high availability. The same to-do application you saw earlier is just deployed up into a Kubernetes environment in this case. But you can kind of see we're pulling it now, pulling its data. And if I come over here and say, OK, let's, let's remove this. And because I, if I'm Dracula, I want to sharpen my fangs, OK? I want to avoid sunlight, and I want to drink some blood. You guys know the legacy, hopefully. I think it's fun. OK, so there we go. So I'm putting that information in the database, and you can see this is just an API that's polling for that data. And we are having some little network problems here, OK? Some little network problems. But let's try this real fast. Here's why it's so awesome. If I want to scale this, let's see what it does here. Oh, oh, oh where'd it go? Where'd it go? This one. OK, come on. And we basically said scale up. Here we are creating new instances of that application server with the complete object relational mapping capability technology built right in. So it's coming online. And again, the network is being a little bit fickle. But let's see if it'll come on. Come on, Sue, come on. So look, you guys all jumped online with me, didn't you? And you guys, you could, this is actually a public facing application. You could even touch it at this moment. But wow, it really got slow here on the network side. But let's see, here it is coming online. And actually, in this case, I'm pretty sure they're online, but the network is slow enough that you can't see it. OK. Oh, boy. All right, all right, all right. But let's actually have a little bit more fun with this. Uh, let's see if this will work for me. kubectl, edit, deployment. All right, this is a Kubernetes, so I can do something magical like this, edit my deployment. And come on now. This is, this is really when the network has gotten very slow, you can kind of tell. <laughs> let's see. I'm on the Vox days one. Let's switch. Let's just try it. Why not? Let's switch to this one over here. Maybe this one will perform a little better. Or it could be we have a major internet brownout here in Cluj-Napoca. OK. Come on. Let's see. Will it work now? I know. You're complaining about your network connectivity. And let's see. Oh, we've got to show you this. We're having a lot of fun at this point. But aren't we having fun? So we've got to make this work. Uh, let's, let's try something else here. OK? If we can't get on the network, I, maybe I can get on my phone. Let's see if my phone will work any better. Um, dun, 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 dun. Maybe. Could be. Let's see if it'll come up. 
so that network seems to be down. The Vox Days one went down on me. Okay. And will it, and of course, yeah, my phone has a connection. Let's see if my phone will connect. I just got the notification that my data package is renewed in my 24-hour allotment for being here in Romania. Let's see if it'll work. Refresh that. Come on. Okay. Will you connect? Will you connect? Nope. Nope. Come on, oh, come on, Mr. Network. Well, this is what happens when you have the internet and rely on it. Okay, we're con it says we're connected. Why are we not getting any responses from anything? Dun, 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 dun. Let's talk to Google. Google's responding, okay. So, come on. I wonder if my cluster is acting up. It could be that my cluster is acting up. Okay, well, let's try another, I actually have a second cluster. Let's go try a second cluster. Very similar to that use case. Let me see if this will work for me. I want to basically, let's go do this. Let's see if this will work for me, if I can connect over here. So in this case, a very similar example to what you saw earlier, but here's what I'm going to do. Instead of that to-do application interacting with my database, this is actually one that receives Kafka messages through something called Knative Eventing. In other words, if you flood Kafka with a ton of messages, it also does a dynamic scale-out event as well. So you can see it scales up to 10 immediately in this case, at least it's trying to, and now it's basically scaling to 30, or at least it's trying to, 50 in this case, and it might go a little bit higher than that, 70. So if you remember earlier where I said we launched 1,026 containers live on stage, that actually was a very large cluster. Mine is actually not so big. But you kind of see how quickly it scales because it's fast and it's small. So trying to get to 95, 99, so 100. And in this case, it's literally booting all those little servers, all those little containers, bringing them up. And you can kind of see they're con connecting here. What pending means is the scheduler, Kubernetes scheduler, is trying to find a place to put it within the cluster. But it is coming online. If I come over here, it's getting up to 18. And just a you know, few more seconds, it'll keep adding them on. 20, 21, 22. All right, it's still getting up there. And we can wait for it, but it'll actually get up there to about 109 or so eventually. And at this point, all the messages are actually consumed. It's just that we can dynamically auto-scale up. I'm kind of curious, though, to see if this will work for me then. Let's see here. OK. One more example of this idea. Here is Node.js running, again, with Knative auto-scaling. So Node.js is coming online. Spring Boot and Quarkus is coming online. And watch what those guys come online. All right, there's our, there's our 109 pods. 96, 97. Will it get to 109? Come on. 98? Almost. Uh, all right, so 109 little application servers up and running. And then, of course, what Knative does, it says, well, you really don't need all that. We don't need all that load. So it starts to terminate them, as an example. All uh, right, so it's starting to terminate them because that's an extreme amount of load. But let's look at this one. And if this goes well, let's see if it'll come up. Okay, yeah, here we go. So right here is my little Quarkus application at 17 megabytes. You can kind of just see it peeking in over there. That's Quarkus. Node.js, 27 megabytes. And then my regular JVM-based application, 111. Okay? So you can see a dramatic difference in size, smaller and faster than Node.js. And so really, that's what's happening over here. And I am curious to why my to-do application, you know, not, go, basically, this thing is having some troubles over here. Okay? It could be I did something to that cluster recently. It seems to be acting up. So the network is working, but my cluster is acting up at this point. We'll have to go back and fix that one. But let's go ahead and wrap up. We are basically out of time, uh, but I want to make sure we wrap up. What did you guys think about that demonstration? Is that cool? All right, let's kind of wrap things up. I just want to show you these things to see kind of where the new world is going. And again, faster or smaller, you can get these charts from our website at quarkus.io. You, you saw it was vastly faster, vastly smaller than anything we've had before with a head of time compilation going all the way to a native image if that's what's required. But it works just fine on a Java virtual machine, and it's still faster and smaller on a JVM. Faster and smaller is better when you pay for that memory and you pay for that CPU by the month by the hour at a public cloud provider, or any Kubernetes cluster for that matter, OK? So it's Kubernetes native. That's been our focus. Like I said, back in 2015, we launched 1,026 containers with Node. Now we believe we can do it with Java as an example. We launched a bunch of them today. So all kinds of different frameworks have already been optimized for this experience. And as a matter of fact, let me show you one more I forgot to show you. If you saw the syntax I was using earlier, OK, this syntax. Uh, how many people here are familiar with this syntax? 
Only, okay, a few of you, fantastic. All right, a few, few of you. But I also have this syntax. You might be more familiar with this one. Okay, maybe you know this version of it. Maybe you're familiar with auto-wired or request mapping, REST controller. So in other words, we can have multiple different frameworks, multiple different technologies that basically can be mapped in here, different, you know, over and above. So check that out as well. And so there's one for business process mapping. So if you're into BPMN or DML, so graphical design of the business process and workflow, that's what Cogito is. We also have great optimizations for something called uh, reactive messaging on small RI. That gives us great technology for Kafka. If you're familiar with the Kafka environment, I can show you the reactive programming model on that as well. But we kind of went to the demo already. This is just the beginning. We are changing the world when it comes to Java. We're making the experience vastly faster, vastly smaller, edit safer, fresh, build an application that runs nicely on the cloud in a native way. And I'll leave you with one more quote to inspire you from Dracula. But we are strong, each our own purpose, and we are stronger together. So please come join our project. It's at Quarkus.io. It is free and open source. It is 0 0.27 a day. It was just born in March, but we're really, really close with it. And actually, a lot of people have already put it in production. So do check out that project. Give us your feedback. And I thank you for your time today. And the URL to the slides, if you need them, is right there.